Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to BioSC 140, Human Physiology. This video will cover S4P1, this is lecture exam four material, the renal system. So, as we started talking about the very first class this semester, form and function are closely related. To understand function, you have to understand form also, which is why anatomy is a prerequisite for this class. But let's look at a little bit of the anatomy of our renal system. So, kidneys. Kidneys are the, the main thing that we're talking about when we talk about the renal system. Uh, let's see what happens when somebody doesn't have a kidney. Well, if somebody does not have a functioning kidney, dialysis is one option. Dialysis is a external mechanical kidney. Basically, the patient goes to a dialysis center or someplace with, you know, that does dialysis, and their blood is ran through a machine that does all of the functions of you know, the kidney or most, you know, enough functions of the kidney um, to keep the person alive. Now, this is great because it keeps the person alive. Uh, this is not so great because it takes multiple hours each session and you need to go multiple times a week. It's very expensive and it's very time consuming. Uh, it's not an ideal option, but it is better than not living. So dialysis is one option if uh, a person does not have any functioning kidneys. Uh, many of you watching this video want to be nurses. Um, a lot of people are employed in dialysis centers and around uh, you know, the, the industry of dialysis, the, um, you know, that aspect of healthcare. Um, there's a lot of people in our society who, who need dialysis and basically every community is, is gonna have dialysis centers. So there's a good chance that some of you might work around dialysis in the future. There's a very good chance that you know, most of you will have a patient who goes to a dialysis center multiple times a week. Another option is transplant. Kidneys, uh, you can, you, if your kidneys fail, you know, you can get a kidney from somebody else. Uh, my brother is diabetic. Um, I want to keep my kidneys healthy because I might need to give my kidneys to my brother. Um, kidneys, um, Diabetes um, is really tough on small blood vessels, and there's a lot of small blood vessels in kidneys, and so kidneys uh, fail often for diabetic patients. And so, you know, I'd love to be able to give my brother a kidney one day, uh, if he needs it. I prefer not, but if he does need it, I'm here for you, Dale. Um, or death, uh, which is not the ideal, uh, ideal situation. Oh. Uh, Selena Gomez, uh, I believe Selena Gomez, uh, her friend gave her uh, a kidney. She had a, a transplant from a, a friend. All right, um, what happens if you have one kidney? Well, Selena Gomez's friend did not sacrifice her life to keep Selena Gomez alive. Um, because with one kidney, you can live. Uh, our kidneys have tremendous renal reserve, meaning our kidneys, their ability to do what kidneys do, fall exceeds, far exceeds the demand that we put on them. Uh, you can live a perfectly normal life with just one kidney. Um, so renal reserve. Uh, each kidney works at about half capacity. So, you know, you can live with one kidney. About one in a thousand people are actually born with one kidney, and it's usually discovered just incidentally you know they they get an x-ray they get imaging done uh looking for some other pathology and then the radiologist goes hey you only have one kidney you know it's kind of interesting it doesn't affect your health situation because you have tremendous renal reserve your one kidney does enough um but you only have one kidney 
quite often the people who are born with one kidney, uh, that one kidney is actually like a jumbo kidney. It's like a, a really, really big one, um, which I think is kind of interesting that the body does that. All right, so the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. Each kidney is made up of around a million different nephrons. So a million different nephrons, these tiny little units that do what the kidney does. Um, the kidney forms urine. It filters blood into the nephron, pulls back some stuff, and secretes some stuff. So what does that mean? So our blood flows into, this is kind of a big picture. Our blood flows into our kidneys. Some of the liquid aspect of our blood filters into the nephron. So we have the liquid aspect of our blood, the plasma. Some of the plasma, most of the plasma, I mean, yeah, some of the plasma will leak out of our bloodstream and into the nephrons. Most of the stuff that leaks into our nephrons is going to be reabsorbed or pulled back into our bodies. And at that point, some additional things are going to be transported actively from our circulatory system back into or into the nephron, into the nephron. So filtration moves things from bloodstream to nephron. Reabsorption moves things from nephron to bloodstream. And secretion moves things from bloodstream to nephron. We're going to look at all these many times uh, throughout these slides. So don't worry, we're, we're going to come back to those in more detail. So the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. What do kidneys do? Know this slide. It's really easy to ask a question, uh, which of the following is a function of the kidney or which of the following is not a function of the kidney. So definitely pay attention to this slide. So regulation of extracellular fluid volume. What is the long-term control of our blood pressure? Blood volume and the kidneys decrease our blood volume by producing urine. Regulation of extracellular fluid osmolarity. So we've talked about osmolarity many times in this class. It's very, very important for normal human functioning. The kidneys help regulate that osmolarity. Remember, osmolarity is important. It helps maintain red blood cell shape. Remember back to the lab where we change the shape of red blood cells using osmolarity. It helps uh, maintain a proper balance of, of fluid within our uh, circulatory system and extracellular fluid. Remember, starlene's forces um, helps prevent edema if we have too much it can have an effect on you know, the amount of extracellular fluid we have. Um, so good regulation there. Um, there's many, um, I feel like many students uh, underestimate the importance of, of osmolarity and the application, really the application of osmolarity to healthcare situations. Um, there's a lot of different healthcare situations where osmolarity uh, gets gets thrown off, becomes abnormal, and it, it's it's common. And some of you might have patients with those issues in the future. Uh, maintenance of ion balance. So amount of sodium, amount of calcium, maintenance of ion balance. Regulation of pH. So another redundant system that helps regulate pH. Excretion of waste products, so nitrogen. Uh, where does most of our nitrogenous waste come from? Uh, the breakdown of amino acids. Uh, we also get some nitrogenous waste. Well, wow, this is kind of a, no, it's different. Um, breakdown of hemoglobin. 
xenobiotics. So what is a xenobiotic? So I remember xenobiotic because of like xenophobia. Um, xeno is like foreign. So and biotics is like life. So it's like foreign biomolecules, um, things like penicillin. You know, penicillin is made by, um, you know, bacteria. And so it's a, a foreign life molecule, xenobiotic. Uh, hormone production. So EPO, what does EPO stand for? Erythropoietin, erythropoietin. Uh, and renin, the, the renin cycle, which we will get to at the end of this lecture. So the renal vasculature has a unique arrangement. Now, we've talked a little bit about this in previous lectures, but we're really going to dive into it. The blood flow and the vasculature arrangement is very, very important to the function. So we have the afferent arterial or the renal artery. The renal artery takes blood from the aorta, uh, the, yeah, the aorta towards the, the kidneys. We then have the afferent arterial. So afferent is like going towards the glomerulus. This is a portal system, meaning there's two capillary beds in, in series. So we have afferent arterial bringing blood to the nephron. Remember, this is one individual nephron and every kidney has a million or so of them. Blood flows to something called the glomerulus. The glomerulus looks like a ball of yarn and it's the first capillary bed. It's the first portal system capillary bed, the glomerulus or glomerular capillaries. After the glomerulus, blood flows into the efferent arterial, efferent arterial, and then it flows into the peritubular capillaries. So peritubular around the tubes capillaries, which is the second portal system the second portal system. This arterial capillary, arterial capillary arrangement is unique to the kidneys. Afferent arterial, glomerulus, efferent arterial, peritubular capillaries. Nephron distribution varies. So we have the medulla and we have the cortex, two different regions within the kidney. And we're gonna have two classifications of nephrons. Most nephrons, 80 to 85%, are called cortical nephrons, cortical nephrons. And their, their glomeruli are located high in the cortex. They have short loops of Henle. So we're gonna talk about how this form and function uh, plays a role. So short loops of Henle. We're also gonna get into what a loop of Henle is soon. It's this loop down here, this loop down here. So cortical nephrons have short loops of Henle. They're located high in the cortex. Juxtamedullary nephrons are next to the medulla, or the glomerulus at least is next to the medulla. 15 to 20% of nephrons are this classification. They have long loops of Henle that go far into the medulla. Long loops of Henle. So the nephron consists of two functional units. Two main, when you look at one nephron as a whole, you can break that one nephron up into two main parts. You have the renal corpuscle, the renal corpuscle, this blue highlighted part, and you have the renal tubules, the renal tubule, which is this gray highlighted part. The function of the renal corpuscle is to form ultrafiltrate through filtration. So blood flows from the afferent arterial into the glomerulus right here. Some fluid will leak out of the glomerulus, some of that plasma will leak out of the glomerular capillaries and into the renal corpuscle. This process is called filtration. And the moment that the liquid fil filters out into the renal corpuscle, its name changes to ultrafiltrate. And repeat that. Its 
vocab word, underlying ultrafiltrate. The moment fluid leaks out or filters out of the glomerulus and into the renal corpuscle, it becomes called ultrafiltrate, changes its name. The renal tubule functions to adjust that filtrate via reabsorption and secretion. So the renal tubule adjusts that ultrafiltrate via reabsorption, which is fluid going from the tubules into the peritubular capillaries, and secretion, which is stuff going from the peritubular capillaries back into the renal tube or into the renal tubule system. So let's look at the glomerular capillaries, the renal corpuscle. Uh, so the renal corpuscle has a glomerular capillary. It looks like a ball of yarn. About 20% of the, of the fluid, the plasma that goes into, 20% of the plasma that goes into the glomerulus filters out into the renal corpuscle. So 20% of the liquid component, not whole blood, the liquid component that flows in the glomerulus flow, um, leaks out into the glomerular cap, um, the glomerulus, sorry, leaks out of the glomerulus into the corpuscle. Red blood cells, white blood cells, the formed elements do not get filtered out. Red blood cells, White blood cells, platelets, the formed elements do not get filtered out. They stay in the bloodstream under normal situations. Proteins do not leave the blood under normal situations. Formed elements and proteins stay in the bloodstream and flow into the efferent arterial. Pretty much everything else in the plasma will leave. Ions, glucose. Pretty much everything that's in plasma will leak out, except for proteins and the formed elements will leak out into the, the capsule. The Bowman's capsule is this capsule that holds the glomerulus. It's got two layers, a parietal layer, which is the outer layer, which kind of contains everything. It directs ultrafiltrate flow, but it does not play a role in filtration. The visceral layer is the inner layer, and the visceral layer is the layer that's actually on top of the glomerulus, that surrounds the glomerulus, and it aids in selective filtering. So this is what a glomerulus looks like. It looks like a ball of yarn. That's the cut edge of a nephron tube. So this is a schematic of what the uh, the renal corpuscle looks like. You can see you have the Bowman's capsule with, and the parietal layer, the parietal layer on the outside. And then you have the visceral layer over the glomerulus on the inside. The visceral layer is composed of cells called podocytes. So break that word down. What does a podiatrist do? Does feet. Podo means foot. So podocyte is a foot cell. And you can see how there's like all these feet coming out of these cells and interdigitating. So what do we mean by interdigitating? If you can see my, my image, uh, interdigitate. It's like the fingers kind of interdigitate. You know, you kind of see how there's all these like loops and and there's a little space in between them. Those spaces in between, that's where the fluid is gonna leak out. So we have, we can then break this down a little further and zoom in a little further. Right here, we have the capillary lumen, so the space in the middle of the capillary. On the outside, we have the capillary epithelial cells, which have, which have fenestrations or pores. So fenestrations or pores in the capillaries. On top of the capillary we have the basement membrane or the basal lamina. Basement membrane or the basal lamina. So let's let's go back. So glomerular fenestrations or the capillary pores right here. That's the epithelial cells for the capillary. 
Uh, formed elements cannot get through these. So formed elements, the red blood cells, white blood cells cannot leave through these pores, but pretty much everything else can. Uh, the slit membrane, or this, this basal membrane right here, it's gonna hold the capillary cells and podocytes together, the basal lamina. It has a negative charge and it's like a coarse sieve. So proteins are not able to get through, proteins are not able to get through this slit membrane, this, this basal lamina layer. And then we have our podocytes. We have our fenestration slits. The fenestration slits are the areas between those podocyte feet. So the slits between pedicles of podocytes. So the pedicles are these little feet on the podocytes, and it's the space in between. And you can see the ultrafiltrate. It becomes ultrafiltrate when the fluid leaks through these three layers and gets into the capsule. Glomerular capillaries are much more permeable than normal capillaries, but they're more selective because of this anatomy. So more liquid leaks out of glomerular capillaries than any other capillaries but it's very selective as to what can be leaked out. All right, so the renal tube you'll consist of two twisted tubes connected by a hairpin loop. So now let's get into the tubules. We have our proximal convoluted tube right here, or PCT. You'll see it PCT a lot, proximal convoluted tube. We then have the loop of Henle with descending and ascending limbs. And then we have the distal convoluted tube or DCT and collecting duct. So what does the renal tubule system as a whole do? It modifies ultrafiltrate through reabsorption and secretion. So our filtration is going from glomerular capillary into the renal corpuscle. Now in this section in the tubule system, we're gonna fine tune that ultrafiltrate via reabsorption or going from tubule system to peritubular capillaries and secretion or things going from peritubular capillaries to the renal tubule system. Three components. So let's look at each of them. Most reabsorption occurs in the proximal convoluted tube. And repeat that. Most reabsorption occurs in the proximal convoluted tube or PCT. So reabsorption is ultrafiltrate, moving towards the peritubular capillaries or the blood. Ions, this is where glucose gets reabsorbed. Remember, normally glucose is not in our urine. Glucose gets filtered, glucose leaves the glomerulus and enters you know, the, the corpuscle and becomes ultrafiltrate. But normally we don't urinate out any glucose because all glucose gets reabsorbed. So ions get reabsorbed, glucose gets reabsorbed, amino acids gets reabsorbed. This happens via passive and active transport. Whenever you see an area that has a lot of mitochondria, mitochondria helps make energy, helps make ATP. Well, active transport requires a lot of ATP, so this part of the system has a lot of mitochondria. It also has a lot of microvilli. So why, what does microvilli do? Microvilli are folds. They're folds that increase surface area. And with more surface area, we're able to get more flux, more movement across the membrane. So the proximal convoluted tube has a lot of mitochondria to power active transport. And it has a lot of microvilli to increase surface area to increase the amount of reabsorption that can happen. There are a certain number of transporters in the proximal convoluted tube. Let's take glucose, for example. There are a certain number. Each one can transport glucose at a certain rate. If every glucose transporter is working as hard as it can, working as fast as it possibly can, there's no way to increase the amount of glucose that can be reabsorbed. There is a maximum rate that glucose can be reabsorbed, a transport maximum, a maximum reabsorption rate for glucose. 
normally in the normal circumstances humans have sufficient transport capabilities for glucose so that all 100 percent glucose gets reabsorbed in diabetics when their glucose levels get exceedingly high 200 300 milligrams per um like really high the amount of glucose in their ultra filtrate exceeds the amount that they can transport back into their bodies it exceeds the amount that they can reabsorb and because of that diabetics sometimes if their blood sugar is uncontrolled will have glucose in their urine it's because they've their uh, the amount of glucose in their ultra filtrate is so high that they are not able to transport all of it back into their peritubular capillaries they're not able to reabsorb it all there is a transport maximum the renal threshold is the plasma concentration when glucose first appears in urine, glycosuria. The loop of Henle concentrates and dilutes ultrafiltrate. So dilute and concentrate ultrafiltrate. It moves solutes in water independently, so solutes are things dissolved in water. The descending limb and ascending limb of the loop of Henle are different. The descending limb is permeable to water. It concentrates ultrafiltrate because water moves from the ultrafiltrate into the peritubular capillaries. It concentrates the ultrafiltrate because you're removing water from the ultrafiltrate. Water moves from the ultrafiltrate into the peritubular capillaries, it gets reabsorbed. The ascending limb is permeable to solutes, but not water. It dilutes because it removes dissolved particles. It removes ions, it removes dissolved particles. So you're removing dissolved particles from the ultrafiltrate, which dilutes it. The loop of Henle concentrates and dilutes, and the length of the loop of Henle affects its function. The longer the loop of Henle, the more water you can reabsorb back into your body. The length of the loop of Henle is under selective evolutionary pressures. The longer your loop of Henle, the more concentrated your ultrafiltrate will be, the more water you can reabsorb in your loop of Henle. Where do beavers live? Beavers build houses on i mean they basically make their own lakes right they build they build a beaver dam and then the big lake forms behind it so they live on lakefront property water is not scarce for beavers beavers have plenty of water they're not worried about dehydration they don't need long loops of henley they have short loops of henley humans a little bit longer loops of henley kangaroo rats so this little guy right here Kangaroo rats are tiny. They live in the desert. There's not a lot of water in the desert. If you want to find one in the desert, you often have to travel very, very far. And these kangaroo rats don't have that option. They get pretty much all their water from their food. Water's a very scarce resource for these kangaroo rats. They don't want to urinate out a lot of water. They want to preserve that water. They have very long loops of Henley to help reabsorb more water. The DCT or distal convoluted tube, this is when, this is where blood secretes things back into the tubule system. So secretion, things moving from our peritubular capillaries, our blood to our filtrate. It fine tunes the ultrafiltrate. It's got two, it's got a few different specialized cells. It's got intercalated cells which transport hydrogen ions from our peritubular capillaries into our ultrafiltrate into our tubule system and it's got principal cells which um, helps affect the amount of water that gets reabsorbed so aquaporins are a channel for water to move through 
And these principal cells can change the number of aquaporins on their membrane, change the number of aquaporins that water is able to, you know, that allow water to leave the tubule system and go back into the um, peritubule system. So principal cells, um, hormones help them regulate the number of pores they have, which help regulate the amount of water that ends up in our urine. And the collecting duct, once ultrafiltrate reaches the collecting duct, it changes its name to urine. Once you're at the collecting duct, you're in. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna conclude part one at this point. As always, if there's anything at all I can do for you, please let me know. I'm here to help and I'll see you in the next video.